The broadcast of the regular meeting of the Heritage Preservation Commission will now begin. Good evening. Uh, welcome to the uh, live broadcast of the regular virtual meeting of the Heritage Preservation Commission. Today is March 16th, 2021. This meeting includes the remote participation of board members and staff as authorized under Minnesota statute section 13D.021 due to the declared local health pandemic. The city will be recording and posting this meeting to the city's website and YouTube channel as a means of increasing the public access and transparency. This meeting is public and subject to the Minnesota Open Meeting Law. For the record, my name is Ken Daler. I am the man manager of legislative support services with the office of the city clerk. I am convening today's meeting in order to conduct elections for the Heritage Preservation Commission's chair, vice chair, and secretary. Once the body has approved uh, elected candidates to those positions, I will turn the chair over to the body's newly elected chair. At this time, I will call the meeting to order. Will the clerk please call the roll to verify the presence of a quorum? Bjornberg. Present. Booty. Present. Howard. Present. Johnson. Present. Nystrom. Present. Sandbolt. Present. Katie. Here. Struthers. Present. Sunberg. Present. Van Der Eich. Here. That's 10 members present. Let the record reflect that we do have quorum. With that, we will proceed to the agenda, a copy of which was posted for public access to the city's legislative information management system, which is available at LIMS, L -I -M -S, dot Minneapolis, M -N, dot gov. Um, on tonight's agenda, we do have one item number six under public hearing, which I understand uh, staff has recommended we pull that item for consent. Um, unless there are any members of the public here who would like to discuss that item or um, um, speak against approving that item, um, we will move that item to consent. So I will wait just a moment to see if there are any uh, members of the public who would like to speak against that item. And you would have to press star six to unmute yourself. All right, seeing no one, um, may I have a motion to adopt the agenda, including moving item number six to the consent agenda? Vanderake, so moved. And is there a second? Second, Commissioner Sundberg. Uh, the agenda has been moved and seconded. With that, I will ask the clerk to call the roll. Bjornberg. Aye. Aye. Howard. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Nystrom. Aye. Sandbolt. Aye. 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 Brothers. Aye. Sunberg. Aye. Van Der Eich. Aye. That's 10 yeas and zero nays. That motion carries and the agenda is adopted. Next on the agenda is acceptance of the minutes of the regular meeting of March 2nd, 2021. May I have a motion to accept those minutes? Howard Summers. Is there a second? Johnson Johnson seconds. That has been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, the clerk will call the roll. Bjornberg. Aye. Booty. Aye. Howard. Aye. 
Johnson. Aye. Nystrom. Aye. Sample. Aye. Sadie. Aye. Struthers. Aye. Sundberg. Aye. Vanderike. Aye. That's 10 yeas and zero nays. That motion carries and the minutes are accepted. Commissioners, the next item of business before us is the election of a chair, vice chair, and secretary of this body. At the March 2nd meeting, commissioners were directed to email any nominations to Secretary Sandbolt. The nominations that have been submitted are as follows. Madeline Sunberg was nominated for chair. Barbara Howard and Claire Vanderreich were nominated for vice chair. And Kimberly Sandbolt was nominated for secretary. Um, I will proceed through each office in that order, chair, vice chair, then secretary. I will ask the body for um, any discussion on the nominations, and then I will ask the clerk to call the roll on those nominations. A majority vote is required for election. For any office with multiple nominations, I will take up those nominations in alphabetical order. I will proceed through the nominations until a commissioner has been elected to the position. We will begin with the election of a chair. Madeline Sunberg is the only nomination for chair. Is there any discussion on that nomination? Seeing none, I will ask the clerk to call the roll. Bjornberg. Aye. Booty. Aye. Howard. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Nystrom. Aye. Sandbolt. Aye. Sadie. Aye. Struthers. Aye. Vanderike. Aye. And forgive me, <laughs> Chair Taylor, would the existing chair vote in this situation? <laughs> uh, you should call her name. It, it's up to her whether or not to vote. Okay. In that case, Chair Sundberg. <laughs> abstain? It seems weird to vote on myself. Okay. I, I will record it as abstain. In that case, there are nine yeas and one abstention. Thank you both. Fantastic. That motion carries and Commissioner Sundberg has been elected chair. Next will be the election of a vice chair. We have two nominations for the role of vice chair. Barbara Howard and Claire Vanderreich uh, have both been nominated for the role. Um, I will first give each candidate the opportunity to speak uh, if they would like to, to provide any uh, comments to the commission about their nominations. Um, so I will go through them in alphabetical order. Uh, and the first one is Commissioner Howard. Good evening, everyone. Um, I wasn't expecting to have to speak tonight until I got the email earlier, so I don't have anything prepared, but I just wanted to say that it's been an honor to be the vice chair uh, in this past year, which has been extremely uh, strange. Um, with all of the things that have happened in Minneapolis that we've all been through a lot, uh, I know that both Commissioner Van Der Eyck and I have a, a sense that we want to move the commission towards uh, being more inclusive and to try to bring the community together through the work that we do. So I think whether you vote for me or vote for Commissioner Van Der Eyck, we're going to be headed in a, a good direction. Thank you, Commissioner Howard. Uh, Commissioner Van Der Eyck. Uh, yeah, I would uh, like to echo what Commissioner Howard said and um, appreciate the opportunity to be nominated um, and uh, it's an it's an honor to be nominated uh, alongside Commissioner Howard um, with her extensive knowledge and experience. So I appreciate uh, just the opportunity to be um, on the ballot with you. So thank you guys for the opportunity and look forward to serving in whatever role um, that the commission prefers. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, Commissioner Van Der Eyck. Um, is there any uh, discussion from other commissioners on on these nominations?
I am not seeing any. So uh, we will proceed to the election of, of the commissioner vice chair. As I mentioned, I will take these nominations in alphabetical order. And once a candidate has received a majority, that candidate is elected and we will proceed to the election of secretary. So we will begin with Commissioner Howard. Uh, clerk, please call the roll on the nomination of Commissioner Howard as vice chair. Jornberg. Aye. Booty. Aye. Howard. Epstein. Johnson. Aye. Nystrom. Aye. Sandbolt. Aye. Stady. Nay. Struthers. Aye. Vanderike. Aye. Sundberg. Aye. That's eight yeas, one nay, and one abstention. That motion carries and Commissioner Howard is elected vice chair. We will now proceed uh, to the nomination of uh, secretary. Uh, Kimberly Sandbolt has been nominated for secretary. Is there any discussion on the nomination of Commissioner Sandbolt? Seeing none, I will ask the clerk to call the roll on Commissioner Sandbolt's nomination for secretary. Bjornberg. Aye. Booty. Aye. Howard. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Nystrom. Aye. Sandbolt. Epstein. Stady. Aye. Others. Aye. And Reich. Aye. Sunberg. Aye. That's nine yeas and one abstention. That motion carries and Commissioner Sandbolt is uh, elected as secretary. Uh, congratulations to all the newly elected officers and I will now turn the meeting over to Chair Sunberg. Thank you. Um, before I begin with the public hearing, let me summarize the process for conducting the public hearing in this virtual format. Um, first, we will act on the consent agenda that we set. Um, and once the consent agenda items are approved, the commission is done with those items and applicants may contact planning staff tomorrow about next steps. After the consent agenda items are approved, We'll take each remaining agenda item in order. First, planning staff will present its report and commissioners may ask questions of staff. Then we'll hear from the applicant and commissioners may ask questions of the applicant. After that, I will open the public hearing and we will invite public comment. Um, we'll be taking speakers in the order they pre-registered if there are any. Speakers will be limited to two minutes. We ask that after your name is called, you state your name and address for the record and then proceed to your comments. After we've completed the list of any pre-registered speakers, we'll see if there are any other speakers in the queue who may have called in. In order to activate your microphone, you'll need to press star six on your phone and wait to hear the pre-recorded message before you start speaking. So again, we'll take the list of pre-registered speakers and then open the floor to any other speakers who may be in the queue. Um, please keep your comments specific to the application that is before us today. After the public comments are complete, I will close the hearing. Commissioners will deliberate and then act on the application before us. Um, I will now open the public hearing on the consent agenda items, which is again item number six. Uh, again, is there any opposition to staff recommendations for these items? Seeing none, I will now close the public hearing on the consent agenda items. May I have a motion to approve staff findings and recommendations for these items? Vanderike so moves. Thank you, Commissioner Vanderike. Is there a second? Johnson seconds. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. Any discussion? Seeing none, um, 
ask the clerk to call the roll. Jornberg. Aye. Booty. Aye. Howard. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Nystrom. Aye. Sandbolt. Aye. Stady. Aye. Struthers. Aye. Vanderyck. Aye. Sundberg. Aye. That's 10 yeas. Thank you, that motion passes. Um, our first discussion item is item number 5, 418 Fifth Street Southeast, Ward 3. This is a certificate of appropriateness. The staff report will be presented by Rob Sklecki. Thank you, Chair Sundberg. Good afternoon, Commissioners. My name is Rob Skalecki, City Planner in the Historic Preservation Section of CPED. Uh, today I'm presenting a Certificate of Appropriateness application for an exterior rehabilitation of the property located at 418 Fifth Street Southeast in the Fifth Street Southeast Historic District. Next slide, please. The subject property is a contributing resource in the Fifth Street Southeast Historic District. The building was completed in 1885 as a frame queen and dwelling by Woodbury Fisk for his daughter, Lizzie Fisk Smith. The exterior rehabilitation scope of work under review for this application has already been completed without applicable permit approvals. Um, therefore, a certificate of appropriateness is required to review the project following the issuance of orders to correct by the zoning inspector on this work. Next slide, please. The applicant has completed uh, multiple exterior alterations to the property which include the following, the removal of landscaping around the foundation to repoint um, the foundation limestone, and including the removal ex of existing parge coating, uh, the removal of the historic wood water table trim at all elevations, and re the replacement of that with ASEX synthetic materials that were molded to match the profile of the historic. The removal of the rear, which is the south or southwest deck, and the rebuild of that with AZAC decking. Uh, the removal and reinstallation of the side, which is the west or northwest porch, uh, with cedar decking and posts, and a replacement storm door is also included as an addition at this entry. Um, the installation of four vinyl basement windows at the property, replacing what appeared to have been uh, historic basement windows on the side elevations. Um, the replacement of one window at the south or southwest rear elevation and the replacement of two additional sash windows on this same elevation with inserts. Um, the replacements are in-kind in profile and the inserts are aluminum clad wood. Uh, the, the full replacement window itself is wood. The large east or southeast picture window was replaced in-kind with wood sash and the deteriorated wood sill was also replaced in kind. Um, the front or the north or northeast uh, was partially rebuilt um, with a new railing for the porch area and stairs installed. Um, the infilled transom above the door was replaced uh, with a transom window and a new storm door was included as well as two ceiling fans and lighting at the porch. Um, additionally, the house has been repainted following select replacement of the deteriorated trim um, and landscape work has included the installation of a chain link fence at the rear side backyard. Next slide, please. The Department of Community Planning and Economic Development has analyzed the certificate of appropriateness for exterior rehabilitation of the property located at 418 Fifth Street Southeast in the Fifth Street Southeast Historic District based on the following findings. Uh, first, staff found that the alterations are compatible with the designation of the historic district, which includes the period and criteria of significance. The subject property is a contributing resource in the 5th Street Southeast Historic District. It's a district that's significant for exhibiting popular 19th and early uh, 20th century architectural styles and, of course, their association to the city development and patterns of the area. The majority of the changes made are compatible with the historic character of the 5th Street Southeast Historic District. 
there was a strong effort made uh, by the owner and the applicant to replace deteriorated materials with in-kind or compatible materials um, according to the guidelines. The overall integrity of the 5th Street Southeast Historic District is not changed by the proposed project and the bulk of the changes made to the dwelling are of appropriate material and or profile for the district. Um, next slide, please. Staff found that the alterations are consistent with the 5th Street Southeast Historic District design guidelines. Uh, the proposed changes are consistent with the scale and dimension guidelines and will not material Im materially impair the architectural or historic value of the building. Um, while the historic wood water table trim has been replaced with a synthetic material, available photos do suggest that the previous wood was deteriorated to a point that would allow for replacement. Um, the completed work matches the historic profile of the water table trim. Um, replacement windows that are located both on rear and side elevations are also not easily visible from uh, public areas and they're not located on primary elevations, so the replacement of them um, was evaluated as such. Um, next slide, please. Staff also found that the material replacement uh, were consistent with the material guidelines for the district. The stone foundation has been restored following the removal of parge coating and tuck pointing of the foundation in select areas on elevations. Um, only a select amount of wood trim was removed and replaced at the property with synthetic materials. The windows replaced at both side and rear uh, elevations were compatible and they're of appropriate wood and or aluminum clad wood. Um, with the exception of the basement windows on the non-primary elevations that are on the side, uh, those are vinyl. However, vinyl windows um, can generally be considered appropriate replacements at non-primary elevations and basement window locations that are not easily visible from the public right of way. The projection the projection and facade guidelines have also been met for the project. Um, the project includes the restoration of the original transom window, as noted before, located above the main entry um, in this location. Windows and door alterations in all locations were installed using compatible materials. Um, the rebuilt side and rear porches are contemporary and compatible, um, and they're not character defining features of the property and also they're not easily visible from the public area. Um, the property owner, however, has installed two highly visible ceiling fans in um, the location um, of the front porch, which are not compatible to the historic character of the district. And staff has conditioned that these be removed and replaced with smaller or um, less visible fans in these locations. Staff also found the project to be consistent with the applicable recommendations contained in the Secretary of the Interior Standards for the treatment of historic properties. And with that, the Department of Community Planning and Economic Development recommends that the Heritage Preservation Commission adopt staff findings for the application by James Miles for the property located at 418 Fifth Street Southeast in the Fifth Street Southeast Historic District and recommend to approve the Certificate of Appropriateness for an extra rehabilitation of the property located at 418 5th Street Southeast in the 5th Street Southeast Historic District subject to the following conditions. Uh, first, the ceiling fans installed at the front porch shall be removed and replaced with smaller models that are not clearly visible from the public right of way, um, as well as additional standard conditions for approval for a certificate of appropriateness. Um, with that, I'm available for any questions. Um, I do believe we may have the applicant here on the line, but I am not certain about that. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for staff? Commissioner Sandvold. Um, I see that in this diagram you show the ceiling fans. Do we have any photos of them as installed? Thank you, Commissioner Sandvold. That's a good question. Um, staff noticed that there was not a photo submitted of the after work um, done by the applicant. Um, this was something that staff noticed when um, inspecting and looking at the property. Um, so this is just based on our recommendation here. And I apologize that we did not notice that there was not a fan photo included from after the installation. The one you see there um, is before, but um, you know, following the installation as as you've seen the um, submitted 
specification sheets for the models, um, they do hang down to a point that are clearly visible, and that's why staff has recommended that they are less visible and smaller in appearance. Thank you. Are there any other questions for staff? I don't see any questions at this time. Thank you, Rob. Um, is the applicant here and would they like to speak? I believe they are. Um, if you could press star six on your phone and then wait to hear the pre-recorded message before it activates your microphone so we can hear you and then state your name and address for the record. Todd, are you on the line? Oh, it looks like maybe the applicant is not here. Um, with that, I will open the public hearing on the item. Um, if there are any other members of the public who wish to speak for or against this application, um, if you could press star six on your phone to let me know that you are there. Doesn't look like there is anybody here to talk about this item. So uh, with that, I will close the public hearing and commissioners, let's discuss. Are there any concerns or comments on the proposed application? This seemed like a pretty good solution to me for work that occurred. Um, luckily, mostly conforming with the guidelines, um, but you know, not quite in the proper process. Um, so I, I guess I thought that this one change uh, to, to change out the fans was fairly reasonable, all things considered. Um, Commissioner Sandbolt. Yeah, I generally agree with staff findings. I think it would have been nice to see a, a photo of the ceiling fans because I feel like that's something that's A, reversible, and B, yes, they're a very modern fan, but that clearly um, separates them from historic character. Um, but I can see that if they would hang down too far, that that might be visually disruptive to the character of the neighborhood. So. In, in light of not having a photo of them, I'm tending to just agree with uh, staff findings. I'll let Claire make her statement and then I might have a motion. Thank you, Commissioner Sample. Commissioner Van Der Eyck. Well, that's what I was gonna do, Kimberly, is uh, make a motion. I just um, wanted to, yeah, I, I don't have strong feelings about the fans. If the applicant had been on and wanted to make reference to why they felt they wanted the fans or we could have that discussion. Um, I, I, I certainly would have been open to hearing that um, so that we would have some reasoning to to disagree with staff findings. Since we don't and we haven't heard from the applicant, um, I, I would take that to mean that they've accepted the staff findings. So from that standpoint, I am going to make a motion to approve um, based on staff findings. Thank you, Commissioner Sandbolt. Commissioner Sandbolt, second. Thank you, Commissioner Sandbolt. We have a motion and a second. Um, I agree. I was open open to discussion with the applicant on if if they had some alternative feelings, but um, since they are not here, I guess that makes our job a little bit easier. Um, is there any further discussion on this item? Seeing none, I'll ask the clerk to call a roll on the motion. Bjornberg. Aye. Booty. Aye. Howard. Aye. Johnson. Uh, <clears throat> Aye. Nystrom. Aye. Sandbolt. Aye. Sadie. Aye. Others. 
Commissioner Struthers? Aye. Van der Eyck? Aye. Sundberg? Aye. Seven yeas and zero nays. Thank you, that motion passes. Our next agenda item is number seven, which is 1103 4th Street Southeast, 406 11th Avenue Southeast, 410 11th Avenue Southeast, all in Ward 3. This is a local designation. The staff report will be presented by Rob Sklecki. Thank you, Chair. Again, I'm Rob Sklecki, City Planner in the Historic Preservation section of CPED. Um, I'm presenting a designation of the Mary Loughran Student Rooming Homes Historic District. The district uh, includes three dwellings located at 1103 4th Street Southeast, 406 11th Avenue Southeast, and 410 11th Avenue Southeast. Next slide, please. On April 21st, 2020, the Minneapolis HPC denied three individual demolition of historic resource applications for the subject properties established interim protection and directed the planning director to prepare or cause to be prepared a designation study for a potential historic district to include these properties. The HPC's decision for each demolition was made on the following findings. Uh, there are reasonable alternatives to demolition. Demolition is not required to correct an unsafe condition. The exterior integrity of the properties is decent. Each building in relationship to the other two buildings under discussion could merit designation as non high style residences designed by William Kenyon as spec properties that served as Dinky Town uh, neighborhood, served the Dinky Town neighborhood as student housing for over a century. Um, the HPC's decisions to deny the demolition of historic resource applications uh, was ultimately appealed and then upheld by Minneapolis City Council on May 22nd, 2020. Next slide, please. Staff is recommending that the Mary Loughran Student Rooming Homes Historic District be designated as a historic district. The subject dwellings are collectively among the best identified grouping of dwellings that retain their original architectural identity and historic integrity to fully communicate their significance as 20th century student rooming homes, um, a type and use of building that's emblematic of the residential Dinky Town and University of Minnesota area. The collection and location of the dwellings and their shared development and residential history is strongly tied to the growth of the University of Minnesota and Dinky Town in the beginning of the 20th century. The properties are significant as a group of William Kenyon designed dwellings that are characteristic of the architect in their construction and styles. Kenyon is known by the city to be a master architect and the properties are among the best examples of a collection of dwellings that retain this cohesive identity to communicate Kenyon's skill and they exist in more modest and practical interpretations of the architect's work in design and massing. Um, as such, staff finds that the properties have significance under criteria one for significant events and patterns of development, for criteria three as distinctive elements of a neighborhood identity tied to residential Dinky Town, and criteria six as works of a master architect uh, with its connection to um, William Kenyon. Next slide, please. The designation study was submitted to the State Historic Preservation Office for comment on December 24th, 2020. In a letter dated February 22nd, 2021, SHPO provided comments um, in agreement with the staff recommendation, recommendation to designate the Mary Loughran Student Rooming Homes Historic District, and they concluded that the district was a good candidate for local designation under criteria one, three, and six. Next slide, please. The designation study was presented to Planning Commission at their Committee of the Whole meeting on February 20, uh, 25th, 2021. Uh, some commissioners did express strong concern and opposition to the district, and that they, they did not feel that the district was worthy of designation, especially given the future land use um, and built form allowances at the parcel, which are community mixed use and corridor six, respectively. Uh, some commissioners suggested that a new development at these parcels could better suit um, or fit the guidance for the properties under Minneapolis 2040. 
Um, other commissioners supported the, the designation of the district, citing that the district has an interesting history and that there's a need to retain and preserve significant properties where um, it sees fit in the city. Next slide, please. Staff found that the designation is consistent with the applicable policies outlined in Minneapolis 2040 in the comprehensive plan. Uh, the Mary Loughran student rooming homes are, are a significant example of an intact William Kenyon designed dwellings in the city of Minneapolis, and they remain among the best examples of uh, student rooming homes with sustained use and a retained collective architectural identity. The properties retain good historic integrity to communicate their collective, his, uh, their collective history as dwellings that represent the student cultural identity of Dinky Town and the related growth of the University of Minnesota, both in their built fabric and in the neighborhood's social history through their past occupants and use. Local designation would highlight this unique collection of dwellings built by a master architect and characteristic of his work. Uh, the city has not yet designated more modest design interpretations of buildings by William Kenyon, who's a master architect, nor has the city des uh, designated a group of neighboring speculatively developed properties by Kenyon. Uh, the histories of renters and women's roles in property development, ownership, and management have long been underrepresented in the body of locally designated properties in the city. Uh, the Mary Loughran Student Rooming Homes Historic District is a strong example of both. The designation will help preserve an important piece of Dinky Town's residential history and communicate the history of the corresponding social, cultural, and institutional growth of the area from that period into the first decades of the 20th century. Um, the buildings have historically been intertwined with transportation, commercial, academic, and institutional, and social patterns which grew up around this area. Um, with that, the Department of Community Planning and Economic Development recommends that the Heritage Preservation Commission and City Council adopt staff findings for the local designation of the Mary Loughran Student Rooming Homes Historic District and recommend to approve the local designation of the Mary Loughran Student Rooming Homes Historic District. Um, and again, with that, I will be available for questions. I do understand that um, the property ownership um, and their team has members who would like to uh, speak publicly um, about the designation of the properties as well. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for staff? I don't see any questions at this time. Um, so with that, I will open the public hearing for this item. Um, it looks like we have a pretty good sized list of people here to speak on this item. Um, and I'm, I'm not entirely sure which members of our members of the public and which members are members of the ownership team. So I'm going to just go through in order. Um, so again, I'll take the list of pre-registered speakers in order and then open the public uh, to public comments who might be in the floor. Um, if you could provide your name and address before making your comments for the record, and if you press star six on your phone and wait to hear the pre-recorded message to activate the microphone so that we can hear you. Um, so the first person I have on my list is Daniel Oberpriller. Press star six. Can you get? I, I heard you for a moment there. Uh, hi, Daniel Overpiller here. Hi, commissioners. Can you hear me? Yes. OK, um, I believe uh, we have from our team on our side, we have um, Carol Lansing on the line. Uh, that will do the speaking on this matter, um, unless you guys have any questions specifically for me um, at the end of this or, or right now. So I'll pass it to Carol. Could you give your address quickly for the record? Oh, sure. 2316 4th Avenue South. Thank you. Minneapolis. Yes. Um, OK, yeah, if you'd like Carol Lansing to do the speaking, that's fine.
Good evening, commissioners. This is Carol Lansing. I'm an attorney at Fagri Drinker Biddle and Reef. Um, our address is 90 South 7th Street. Not that we go in there very often these days. Um, I am representing North Bay Companies, and the owner of these three houses, and North Bay does object uh, to the proposed designation. The CPED study, and we did supply a letter today, and I realized um, we may not have had much time to review that. I think the key point is that the CPED study does not provide a clear, well-reasoned, or factually supported basis for recommending designation of these three houses as a historic district. The primary and pervasive flaw in the study is that it does not research or adequately evaluate the context of student rooming houses or modest Kenyan designs, or the relevance of the Lachlan houses within those contexts. So regarding the first designation criteria um, discussed in the staff report, um, you know, before the HPC hearing uh, regarding demolition of these houses, I don't believe anyone had suggested that student rooming houses might be a context of historic significance for study. As I expressed during the last hearing, I find it regrettable that city staff were directed to expend time and resources on evaluating this topic without discussion of whether it, of all the possible contexts and previous contexts that have been suggested for study, um, were considered and, and that whether this deserved to be prioritized. But regardless of my thoughts on whether student rooming houses is a context that merits study, the study the city produced does little to document the history or significance of student rooming houses. The study contains no inventory of historical and current student rooming houses. It only mentions a few early examples, and it therefore can provide no actual and comparative basis for the assertion, and I'm quoting here, that the subject dwellings are collectively among the best identified grouping of dwellings that retain their original architectural identity and historic integrity to fully communicate their significance as student rooming homes. Um, you can't make that statement or that conclusion without having done the inventory and the comparative analysis. Even if the study had established student rooming houses as a significant pattern of social history, the Lachlan houses were not designed as rooming houses, and they have no exterior alterations that reflect such use, so they are not able, as suggested by staff, to visually communicate their significance as student rooming houses. You know, I'll note that the house at 1103 Fourth Street has not even been a rooming house since 1973 when it was converted into four apartments, and that many of the rumors throughout time and currently were not and are not even students. And very importantly, the SHPO concurrence that the houses are significant for their association with the development of student rooming houses is premised on the inaccurate belief that all three dwellings were, and I'm quoting again, were constructed explicitly as rooming houses. None of them were. The study tries to bolster the significance for the Lachlan houses, really with kind of a proof by a negative, by asserting there's not enough evidence to suggest Lachlan built the dwellings with the intent of them remaining for single family use. Well, that's kind of a, you know, how do you prove that negative? But certainly the strongest and only evidence of the originally intended use of these buildings is their original design and construction as single family homes and the identity of the original renters who utilized these properties as single family homes. The Lachlan, you know, and I also believe that this territory has been covered. The Lachlan houses first came into use as rooming houses when they were rented as chapter houses for sororities and fraternities. The city previously evaluated these houses and their significance in that context and chose not to include them as part of the Greek letter chapter house historic district because they were not built as chapter houses. If they were determined as non-contributing in the context of their earliest form of congregate living use as chapter houses, in my mind, the case for their significance due to subsequent use for congregate living by unaffiliated residences is just as weak or weaker. So finally, on that point, in conclusion, on that point, the study just does not establish student rooming houses as a historically significant context or pattern of cultural, economic, or social history, and it does not establish that these three houses are emblematic of any presumed pattern of history. Briefly on the second um, criterion that staff recommends as being met um, 
association with distinctive elements of neighborhood identity. Um, they are applying that criteria uh, so broadly, so generally as to make it meaningless. Examples of truly distinctive elements of city identity include the Fauché, the Grain Belt sign, and the Stone Arch Bridge. On the neighborhood level, features like the Witch's Hat Water Tower and Prospect Park or other visually prominent, unique, and known and beloved structural, artistic, or landscape features could meet this criterion. But there's simply nothing about these three homes, individually or collectively, that is a distinctive identifier of the Marcy Homes neighborhood or Dinky Town. Staff's argument really just proves that they look like the thousands of other houses in those neighborhoods. On the criterion related to Kenyon as a master architect, um, in recommending that this designation study be conducted, commissioners expressed interest in considering Kenyon's architectural career as a whole, rather than just focusing on his high style residential work. The CPET study, however, fails to broadly study Kenyon houses throughout the city, so it does not provide a factual or analytical basis to support the conclusion that the Lachlan houses are, quoting, among the best examples of a collection of dwellings um, of Kenyon's more modest and practical interpretation. Again, the study doesn't do the work to establish the context of Kenyon designed homes and comparatively evaluate the Lachlan houses in that context. It provides no analysis of what constitutes modest and practical architecture and no comparison of other, once defined, modest Kenyan designs to the Lachlan houses to support the assertion that the Lachlan houses were modest, Kenyan works, or much less the best example of such works. I provided a list of known Kenyan houses from a previous designation of the Chase residence, which was found to be a significant Kenyan designed shingle style house. Um, that study identified these um, previously landmark Kenyan design buildings. It went on to identify 25 other Kenyan buildings, primarily houses that had been identified through surveys as historic resources, and another 67 houses and other buildings and designs associated with Kenyan um, that are meant most of which are extant in the, in the city. Um, you know, as noted in the landscape research eligibility study, um, Kenyon was noted for heavily decorated costly mansions, but also executed simple frame houses and favored revival styles. These houses are not known to be unique among his work, but, and certainly it seems that some of the 60 some houses identified by Grunman include many simpler Kenyan styles, but we don't know because CPED has provided no information about these houses, about their style, size, cost to build, or integrity um, of these dozens of other houses. And the fact that um, the houses on the Grunman list are primarily located in the Lowry Hill neighborhood and the Lachlan houses are located in Marcy Homes is not indicative of whether the Lachlan homes were designed and built as more modest houses. Um, you know, Kenyon was designing heavy concentrations of homes in both these neighborhoods during the same time period because those were the areas of residential growth in the late 1800s and 1900s. I've attached a letter from Amy Lucas that explains, it's dated April 30th, 2020, that at the time of construction of the Lockham houses, these two neighborhoods represented similar economic classes. It's later developments with the expansion of the University of Minnesota and the construction of I-35 that affected the residential community and economic um, relative economic status of the Marcy Homes neighborhood while Lowry Hills property values remain stable. Nor is the fact that the Lachlan houses are constructed on adjacent lots sufficient to make them an exemplary collection. Um, you know, in looking at the list on the Chase study, you can see that there are over 25 Kenyan houses located in the Lowry Hill area, um, fully studied. Um, all of those houses, a designation of a discontinuous district in Lowry Hill might serve the commission's uh, expressed interest most fully because it could represent the range of his work, both high style and more modest and practical. Um, both the, um, moving on to the relationship of, to the city's comprehensive plan, um, 
I noted in the letter that, you know, we acknowledge that there's, you know, a particular pro proposal may be consistent with some comprehensive plans and inconsistent with others. And there's often a tension I, between preservation policies and development policies. But clearly, designation of these buildings would have an adverse impact for the city's goals related to future land use and built form that call for high density mixed use development on this site. Now, consistency with the preservation policies cited in the staff report is contingent on these houses actually having historic significance. Um, and as discussed, we disagree with the conclusions in that regard. But even if they are historically significant, we also disagree that designation of the lock and houses supports policy 60 related to the intrinsic value of properties. As we've discussed, long term preservation of these houses is not economically feasible. So designation will not, as suggested by staff, protect the homes for years to come. Um, nor do we believe that policy 92 is uh, well supported by this designation. Um, there's no explanation in the study for how these houses, which are indistinguishable from thousands of others that have evolved into student rental, represent, as quoted in the staff report, related to this policy, the student cultural identity, Dinky Town, and the rel related growth of the University of Minnesota. Um, nor, as staff asserts, do, does designation um, promote, you know, you know, tell us the story of the histories of renters and women's roles in property development, ownership, and management, because it does not detail a context of student renters. And with respect to Mary Lachlan's role in property development, management, ownership, the CPED report contains much conjecture, but little additional information than was available through the landscape research eligibility study. And importantly, staff conclude that the houses are not significant because of their association with Mary Lachlan. And finally, um, with respect to the effect on the surrounding area and, and relating again to the economic and feasibility of um, renovating these houses. Um, preservation will not positively affect the surrounding area because the, as they say, the buildings will serve as an example of high quality housing preservation through sustainable practices that reduce human environmental impact. The fact is these houses are not high quality housing and they've outlived their useful life as rooming houses, apartments or otherwise. Preservation of poor quality housing is not beneficial for the neighborhood and does not honor the history or character of Dinkytown, Marcy Homes, Kenyon, or student renters. In contrast, the proposed redevelopment that North Bay would undertake would be high quality, energy efficient residential units, a portion of which would be affordable in accordance with the city's inclusionary zoning requirements and would be positive development for both future renters and the surrounding area. So thank you for your time. Um, we do believe that based on the facts and reasons we've provided and the lack of facts and analysis in the staff report that the Heritage Preservation Commission should recommend against designation of the proposed district. Thank you for your comments. Are there any questions for the ownership team? I don't see any questions. Thank you for speaking with us today. Um, I will move on to the other members signed up um, in the public speaking queue. The next on the list is Garrett Duncan. Der Garrett, if you could press star six. Hello, I'm actually with the uh applicant as well and I don't have any additional comments to make yet to what Carol just made. Okay, thank you. Um next on the list is Barbara Cam. Barbara if you could press star six. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. My name is Barbara Cam. I'm on the Marcy Holmes Neighborhood Association Board. 
I only have 423 Seventh Street Southeast. I'm going to read from a letter we submitted to the HPC and contest Carol Lansing's statement. Madam Chair and Commission members, the Marcy Homes Neighborhood Association supports staff's recommendation that the Mary Laughlin Student Rooming Homes be designated as a local historic district. In our May 2020 letter to the HPC, we propose that the houses qualify under significance criteria one, three, and six. Staff's designation study concurs with that recommendation. Criterion one, these houses are emblematic of social patterns and cultural trends associated with Stinky Town and student housing in relation to the University of Minnesota. Due to the burgeoning student population between 1880 and 1910, many homes were converted to house students and, and sorority and fraternity groups. Mary Lachlan's homes, built in 1901, were converted to rooming houses between 1909 and 1911, and they continue their historic use as high density affordable housing and visual, uh, visually association, uh, and visual association to the transformation of university and neighborhood at the beginning of the new century. Criterion three, student rooming homes have been historically more associated with Stinky Town and Marcy Homes than with any other area in Minneapolis. As staff has noted, the Marcy Lock and the Mary Lachlan rooming homes represent both the academic centered residential history of the student population in Dinky Town and the distinct elements of Dinky Town's identity in the context of the Marcy Homes neighborhood. Criterion six, these buildings represent three different architectural styles and are important examples of William Kenyon designed dwellings in the city of Minneapolis and retain a collective architectural identity. Designating this collection of dwellings as a local historic district will augment his legacy, demonstrate that an architect's body of work should be considered as a continuum and preserve the history of that work. In their February 22nd letter, Shippo suggested that the adjacent three Mary Lachlan houses designed by Kenyon be part of the Mary Lachlan student rooming houses historic district. And we wonder, has HPC considered including them? With regard to the 2040 plan, the proposed designation supports the 2040 plan's future use for the area, for future land use for the area, and the corridor six built form district building heights between two and six stories. And policies 60, 92, and 93, which address historic properties, districts, resources, and context apply to this designation. We are concerned about the diminishing the availability of affordable housing in Marcy Homes. The three historic houses provide about 30, somewhere between 30 and 36 much needed affordable bedrooms at $385 to $420 per month and are potentially to be demolished and replaced by 65 micro units with monthly rents of $1,250 to $1,350 with four or five to five of the units designated as affordable. Student rooming houses are part of a very early and ongoing historic use in Dinky Town, in which they were a major part of the community. Designating the Mary Lachlan rooming homes as a local historic district continues that historic use. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, next on the list is Eric Wunderlich. If you could press star six, Eric. Good afternoon, this is Eric Wunderlich. I live at 413 Fifth Street Southeast in the Marcy Homes neighborhood. And I'm going to speak on behalf of Preserve Historic Dinky Town. So thank you, commission members. Um, Preserve Historic Dinky Town wishes to convey its strong support for the Mary Lochran Student Rooming Homes District, Historic District, in the staff report that recommends its designation. The report and criteria descriptions provide an excellent understanding of the social, architectural, and cultural importance of Dinky Town's residential history, as it has historically been intertwined with the transportation, commercial, academic, institutional, and social patterns which grew around this area. But the preservation of the district is not just about the past, it's also about the present and the future. The university area rooming house has been intrinsic to the creative cultural contributions of Dinky Town, to the city, the state, and even the nation. Much of the cultural creativity and artistic political activity documented in PhD's Dinky, that's Preserve Historic Dinky Town, PhD's Dinky Town, A Living History, 
was born in its rooming houses, where, you missed, where musicians, writers, and political figures met, created, and conspired, including Hubert Humphrey, Bob Dylan, Frederick Manford, Fred, and dozens more. The area rooming houses make it possible only, not only for students, but for graduates, businesses, social justice, and cultural entrepreneurs to generate and innovate on the economic fringe with direct access to all the assets of the area. This form of housing supports cultural, social, and economic diversity. It should not be preserved only as a remnant, but as a vital and important element of Dinkytown's living history. To this end, PhD also supports the State Historic Preservation Office's recommendation to include the other three residences located at 1107, 1111, and 1115 4th Street Southeast in the boundary of the Mary Lochran Student Rooming Homes Historic District. Thank you very much for your work on the commi commission and in our community. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Next on the list is Mick Stoddard. Mick, if you could press star six. Hello, this is Mick Stoddard with DJI Architecture. Uh, I'm also with the uh, development team, so I'll just, I don't have anything to say, thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, next, I believe, Chris Meyer is on the line. Chris, if you could press star six. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Chris Meyer. I live at 601 6th Street Southeast. I sit on the planning commission, um, but I'm speaking on my own behalf today just as a uh, member of the Marcy Holmes uh, neighborhood. I walk by this place um, that's being considered almost on a daily basis and in the uh, 15 years or so that I lived here, I uh, never found it remarkable at all. Um, you know, I, I appreciate all of the um, historic properties in the neighborhood that have been preserved. I'm, I'm very grateful for the Fifth Street um, Historic District and uh, the Greek Life Historic District. Um, and I think there are some other properties actually on this block itself that, that aren't yet protected that would be worthy of it. But these three houses are, are just completely unremarkable. You could see, see them almost anywhere in the city. And there's nothing that really connects the three of them. I mean, one has like a barn-like shape, the other two don't. I mean, um, I've been inside of, of two out of the three um, while I was door knocking uh, back in 2017. Uh, they were pretty dilapidated on uh, the inside, and I, I just think it would uh, set a, a really bad precedent to designate these buildings as historic um, when, I mean, there's just really not a lot of historic uh, value to them, and, um, you know, it competes with a lot of the other 2040 goals. This is um, Corridor 6. You know, it could have higher density housing. And I feel like a lot of the motivation to get this is motivated, you know, by opposition to higher density in the neighborhood as opposed to, you know, general concern about like preserving these specific buildings. So, you know, we've already taken um, a lot of, you know, plots off the potential market by, by designating them historic. And I, I think, you know, when we do that, um, we should try to make up for that by allowing more density elsewhere. Um, so, you know, I would urge you uh, to not accept this um, today uh, because they're really not very remarkable buildings. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Um, is there, that's, that's the list of pre-registered speakers, um, but I'm wondering if there are any other speakers um, who wish to speak for or against uh, this item, if you could press star six to let me know that you are there. Okay, seeing none, I will close the public hearing. Um, commissioners, 
uh, let's discuss. I realize this is a maybe slightly trickier one. Um, are there any concerns or comments on this proposed application? Commissioner Howard. Hello again. Um, I just want to uh, make a couple points. I think it's really important to remember that historic properties does not equate to something that is remarkable or outstanding in design. Um, it has to do with, with the history of the property and whether or not that history has some significance. Um, I think that uh, in relation to the three designation criteria that we're looking at, the strongest here that we have a context for is the rooming house context. I think it, the, the context of, of student housing and um, associated housing, so not just students, but uh, professors and associated uh, uh, communities, uh, communities that are associated with the university kind of all come together in the idea of these, these rooming houses. Um, the fact that it, it happens to look like a single family, family dwelling, that the three of them happen to look like single family dwellings, actually fits very well within that context as it's been presented. Um, I think that the, the criteria related uh, to the distinctive elements of city or neighborhood identity, I think that is a little weaker. Um, we don't, of course, have a de definition for distinctive elements. Um, and I think that the uh, context that's presented for Kenyon is also a little weak, um, but I think it's important to remember that our criterion actually says the property exemplifies works of masters and, and exemplify means to typify. It's a, it's a typical example of, of the design. So our criteria are a little iffy on some of these things, but I think the strongest here is that rooming house context. Um, and I think I'm, um, I'm still on the fence on this one. Uh, I think that is the strongest one. I'm, I'm curious to see what other commissioners have to say tonight. Thank you, Commissioner Howard. Commissioner Struthers. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I have just a couple of comments. Um, as you know, I'm a new commissioner and I wasn't here when the ac actions were taken last year. I did read the um, the designate or these studies on the demolition requests that were included in our materials. And um, I listened to the discussion on um, in the archives on the meeting that you had in 2020 to discuss this. And I have to say, when I read the report from last year and I listen to that discussion, I find it hard to reconcile the statements in the report about um, criteria one, three, and six. And I didn't see in the reports necessarily the facts that that uh, changed the ultimate analysis in those areas. And I should mention that I am a resident of a rooming house in the university area. I lived in one for about a year, almost 50 years ago when I was a first year law student. Not one of these three, but one down the street on 4th uh, Street, and I'm very sympathetic to the whole concept of, um, of, of, of recognizing these kinds of properties. But um, I have to say, and I actually drove over to walk in front of these and look at them and see what I could feel when I was there, and they don't really communicate the rooming house experience to me as a historical matter. So I'm having a little trouble with criterion one. Um, uh, likewise, I had concerns with criteria three and six being uh, uh, being met. And I realized that this is a, it's difficult and probably different people will view these in a different way. But, but I, um, when I read the staff reports on criteria one, three and six back in 2020, and I read them again now, I had trouble reconciling them in my own mind. Um, so that's something that I'm wrestling with. I guess to the extent that the commission, if it does conclude that the staff report is the way to go, I also have a question about why, what about the other three? I mean, there's language in the, in the staff report in 2021 that talks about that each building in relationship to the other two um, 
could merit designation as non high style residences designed by William Kenwood Ken Yun, but I um, and I'm sorry I forgot to turn my camera on. I'll do that so you can see me. Um, but I but I do wonder why the commission wouldn't at least consider the other three that are contiguous. I mean, there are six, one on the corner, three on 4th Street and two on 11th. And I would think that if we're making that argument that they are somehow more important together, we'd want to take a look at the at the other three that haven't been addressed. That would be consistent also with what the state office suggested in their letter. And and if the decision is to approve the protection for these um, existing three that we've been talking about, I think consideration should be given to um, also looking into the other three in more detail. Um, and finally, in that same line, it almost seems arbitrary to call out these three and not the other three, unless there's some basis for, for making that decision. And I don't know if there is or isn't at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Struthers. Um, I'm wondering if staff could quickly address that question of why these three and not the other three were looked at in, in this context. The three in question that were being studied were as a result of the demolition of historical resource applications that were heard in front of you um, a little less than a year ago. Um, so they are the three properties in question um, that are being evaluated due to that action. Um, you know, any other attempt to um, study the other three properties um, that kind of falls outside of the original applications that were heard. OK, thank you. Um, Commissioner Stady. Hi. I just I wanted to thank Commissioner Struthers for speaking and giving uh, some comments. I'd really like to hear from because a lot of us, uh, a lot, a lot of the folks on the commission were not in the meeting last time. I'd like to hear, if possible, from all the new commissioners. Uh, my thinking about this when we met, uh, it was a very, it was the beginning of the pandemic. My concern was that these would get demolished and nothing would be built in their place. I feel like that concern is not one uh, that I have anymore, considering that students will be returning to the university in the fall uh, full time. So uh, that's that's where I am on this. Uh, but I yeah, I would really like to hear from more of the new commissioners about this. Thank you, Commissioner Stady. Um, I was trying to remember uh, what exactly my thoughts were when we saw um, this previously um, I do remember our discussion about uh, concerns of, of a fast demolition and um, you know the, the current status of everything um, I think Commissioner Struthers to kind of address your comment a little bit um, because this came through as a demolition we were only looking at the properties um, as, as Rob said that were because it was based off of a permit, which is a little bit different process than if um, we're nominating a district um, because of a survey done of an area or something. It's so, sort of a different process, and that's when we're more likely to bring in uh, a, a wider range of properties. Although I agree um, with your feelings that with all six properties, um, the case for this district would probably be a bit stronger. Um, Andrea, do you have some comments on that that might be helpful? Yeah, Andrea Burke, the supervisor for the CPED team, um, HP team. The reason uh, going back to April of 2020, it did come up in the meeting about including the additional three properties on that block. And while the HPC can for lack of a better term, drop a nomination during a meeting without notice. Uh, we didn't feel, or at least there were comments made that it didn't feel it was appropriate to group these other three in these property owners without sufficient notice that any of this was happening. Um, because should they had been included in this, um, and it wasn't a nomination, it was a demolition uh, or a denial of a demolition 
they would have been captured under interim protection for a year and that can happen. It just gets really squirrely and uncomfortable when, you know, they didn't even show up to the meeting and then suddenly they had these restrictions or, you know, put on them really without their notice. And the commissioners felt that it really wasn't an appropriate time to do that at that particular meeting and waiting to see the outcome of uh, the study who, uh, it was actually Commissioner Mack who overturned it and made the findings to, to uh, include or to desert, or excuse me, to deny the demolition and, and start the designation study on this, um, you know, going forward, it, it is always possible to nominate the other three, but that is why they weren't included. Um, you know, we are aware of the state's comments on it, but um, that is that is ultimately why they were not included in the, the group. Thank you, Andrea. Um, Commissioner Struthers, do you have a follow up question? I, I do. The question I have is I wasn't suggesting that they be put into a historical district today. But my question really was if the commission is inclined to designate these three as a district, wouldn't now be the time to extend protection to the other three properties and do a study? I mean, maybe they don't qualify even though they were designed by the same architect for the same buyer, but it would seem to me that now might be the time to extend that protection and, uh, and study them to see if in fact it would make sense. Thank you, Commissioner Struthers. I do. That is something we can do. If that's something the commission wants to do, we we can uh, go. Andrea, do you have a, a a good response to that? I just wanted to make a comment in response to to Commissioner Struthers, and then also to you, Chair Sinberg, on that. That is a possibility. I would strongly advise to continue that or bring that up in, you know, mentioning that on a later date, um, you know, possibly under new business that you intend to do that so that we have time to, should you go in that direction to let the property owners know, um, just in all fairness and transparency and give them an appropriate chance to speak and, and speak their case. Cause I do not believe they are here tonight. And um, it does, you know, when you do make a motion to nominate and accept something, it does come with some, some strings attached. Well, not some, some very large strings attached. So that's my advice on that. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, Commissioner Howard. Uh, related to this conversation, uh, Andrea, if if we were to designate these or free to, to approve this designation today, would the other three properties be uh, flagged within city systems as being potentially historic? Therefore, if uh, uh, demolition permits were to come up for them or if any kind of um, alterations, uh, building permit or request to do alterations would come up for them, would they be flagged um, to go through this process similar to demolition uh, review we had on these three. I guess the question, I, I am very concerned about putting any kind of um, strings on the other properties with the property owners not being in the room and, and part of this conversation. Um, so I'm just curious what, what happens if, if we were to designate this um, district, what happens with, the, with those other three? Thanks for your question, Commissioner Howard. If this were to be designated, keep in mind that it is just a recommendation and that it would go to the uh, Business Inspections, Housing and Zoning Committee of the City Council next, where your recommendation would be further heard and either accepted or overturned before it got to the City Council. But in terms of what those other properties, let's say hypothetically, there was a recommendation made by the HPC. Let's just say the biz committee made concurred with your recommendation and forwarded on to the council. They accepted it. At this point, there are no other flags on the other three properties other than sort of what staff is aware of. You know, should those properties come through for, let's say, the developer or the owners or somebody were it to buy them and submit a demolition permit the way the ordinance and the 
uh, is set up, staff has an opportunity to review every demolition permit in the city to, to look for um, historic significance. So it potentially would be reviewed in that capacity. Um, but without the presence of a, nom a formal nomination by one of the five individuals who can make one, one of which is an HPC commissioner, um, there are no formal protections or formal stopping or reviewing of permits of those three properties. Thank you for the clarification, Andrea. I think um, kind of, I guess, circling back on the discussion, um, I agree with Commissioner Howard that I found the rooming um, house argument to be the strongest of the three arguments for historical significance. Um, I think it's an interesting area of uh, the, the city's history that hasn't been studied extensively. Um, and so I think I, I understand um, the the feeling in the public that maybe um, there there hasn't been a lot of context study on this area. And I, I think that was sort of the point of our request was we wanted some context study on that and that this gives us that that opening. Um, to look at this this history more, um, and that uh, one of the the things the commission has been pushing for more recently is is to broaden the number the the types the diversity of the histories that we um, preserve, and so that um, I guess the argument that there's nothing particularly special about these houses is in some way, um, at least to me, the point um that we're we're saving something that that is that was the norm and is slowly decreasing as the norm as new development uh ch changes the landscape um and so i guess to me i um I'm, I'm supportive of this designation um although i i understand and sympathize with the feeling um of, of the property owner. Um, I also think that as the neighborhood commented, um, this is a, a way of preserving um, a, a type of affordable housing. Um, it's it's not quite the same as, as newly constructed affordable housing, um, this sort of naturally occurring affordability. Um, is is part like preservation with the little p is part of what we want to do as the preservation commission so i guess i i feel like in my mind this supports that as well um but that's that's just my feelings on it um i'm wondering if oh good commissioner nystrom another new commissioner to speak hi um yeah so um chair Sunberg, i actually was going to chime in, but I wanted you to finish because I agree with both you and Commissioner Howard. Um, I believe that that <clears throat> first one of the rooming house is the strongest argument that's made of them. And I also agree that it's kind of the point that they're not remarkable. Um, so I I understand and I, I'm basically reiterating what you're saying, but I, I fully agree with you. I think it's kind of the point to preserve these because they're not necessarily the the shining star but also they are something that is not as common anymore and disappearing in the feel of dinky town um as a uh someone who has spent time in dinky town over the last decade or so um i i enjoy seeing these types of um rooming houses it reminds me of a time when i was in college um compared to seeing large stacks of um, new construction. Um, and so I think part of the preservation of this is to preserve the, the cheaper housing um, as well for students who are attending school or just more affordable housing for people who live in that neighborhood. And so um, I think I agree with you that I am supportive of this, but also empathize that they're not necessarily everyone's 
favorite to kind of walk by or view, but um, yeah, those are my sentiments on it. So. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? Commissioner Vanderike. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I I agree um, with with everything that's been said, um, and I don't have a ton to add. I think what I the only thing I would add to this from my perspective is while I understand and I certainly um, appreciate our fellow planning commissioner um, uh, speaking as a as a constituent and a resident of the of the neighborhood. Um, you know, I always value the opportunity to kind of overlap those two different perspectives um, which I think we have more in common with than we're often portrayed as. Um, and while I while I, I agree um, with kind of this, you know, this reoccurring theme of remarkability and like, are these the best example? Well, from my perspective, um, and I think the, the right way, in my opinion, to view this is that we don't have a choice about um, which one's the best one right now. The choice we have before us today is these three buildings. Um, I felt that the, uh, I, I, I disagree in that the report um, didn't make a strong case. I think, it, I think it made a strong enough case that I, I felt um, I agreed with it. I agree with the findings. Um, I was open to hearing anything that, and still am, if there's commissioners that have strong feelings one way or the other um, to get some additional perspective on. But from my standpoint, if uh, we're looking at it with these three buildings before us today, not knowing what would come before us again and what other opportunities we might have to um, protect and, and preserve other examples of this type of development in uh, Dinky Town, then I think this is an opportunity to do just that. And so I would um, fully support um, approving staff findings as written. Um, I, I want to hold back making a motion in case any other commissioners have anything else to add, but um, I am in support of doing so. Thank you, Commissioner Van Der Eyck. Commissioner Booty. Hi, uh, yes, thank you, uh, Chair Sundberg. Um, I uh, can also speak as a new commissioner who was not here last um, time that this was came across um, the agenda. Um, and uh, I, I've had some similar thoughts as other commissioners um, in regards to this application or to the to the um, designation of this district. Um, I want to say I'm, I'm maybe this is the wrong place for it, but I know that the the demolition request was denied um, last year, partially because there was not a reuse um, or a reuse study or reuse um, plan that was put before us. And I'm curious, it may not be the the point of designating this, but um, I know that that necessar wasn't necessarily unless I missed something a part of the um, you know the the applicants um, hearing today wasn't necessarily an option that they gave. Um, as someone who's very much uh, preservation minded, I, I'm, you know, not just the fact that they're, they're maybe not the most remarkable buildings, but they are old materials. They are sustainable materials that in a house that could be very much sustainable if it was reused. Um, and I, I want to um, highlight the the point that I believe the neighborhood commission or um, or the neighborhood group made of, you know, these are natural occurring affordable housing. Um, they could potentially be um uh sustainable housing if you know old houses can be sustainable too um is essentially the point i want to make i don't know if this is the place to make that comment um but uh and i think i would echo what other commissioners have said in that i i do generally agree with the report um and uh uh to even more so with uh uh commissioner van Der Eyck just now you know this is what we have before us right now um you know there's we, we could wait and see, I guess, what others um, might, uh, what other research might um, do, but, you know, this is what's before us and this is what we have to vote on. And and I, I think that, you know, the staff report does outline, uh, outline a good um, representation of, you know, why these are historic. Thank you, Commissioner Booty. Um, to kind of address your question, when we see a demolition application, they don't need to provide um a any drawings of what they are proposing to build there um if it's not a, a designated pro like so if now that this is you know if this was designated as a district and then they were going to build something demo and build something then they would need to provide the drawings um but if it's 
being pulled because it's a demolition and it's not in a pre-existing district or a pre-existing designated building they don't need to provide anything for in terms of what their reuse will be um, that's I would say one of the advantages of a, a district is that then we do get to see what any sort of reuse would be. So that's that's sort of where that line is. Um, it sounds like there seems to be a general consensus on support. Oh, good. Commissioner Howard, <laughs> can you make a motion? I'd like to make a motion to approve the local designation of the Mary Loughran Student Rooming Homes Historic District. Thank you. Is there a second? Vander Eyck seconds. Thank you, Commissioner Van Der Eyck. Any further discussion? Seeing none, I would like to ask the clerk to call a roll on the motion. Bjornberg. Aye. Moody. Aye. Howard. Aye. Johnson. Aye. 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 Struthers. No. Van Der Eyck. Aye. Sundberg. Commissioner Sundberg. Aye. All right, so it's nine yays and one nay. Thank you, that motion passes. Um, our next agenda item is number eight. This is the Cavalry Baptist Church, 2608 Blaisdell Avenue South, Ward 10, designation study. The staff report will be presented by Rob Sklecki. Thanks again, Chair. Again, my name is Rob Skalecki, City Planner in the Historic Preservation Section of CPED. Uh, I'm presenting the Calvary Baptist Church National Register of Historic Places nomination for HPC CLG comment. The property is located at 2608 Blaisdell Avenue South. Next slide, please. The property is an individual landmark locally designated by the city of Minneapolis. Uh, the parcel was designated as a landmark in 1995 for cultural history and the representation of growth of the Baptist Church um, in Minneapolis, as well as its significance for the work of Warren, Dub or Warren H. Hayes and Harry Wild Jones, who are both master architects. Um, the National Register of Historic Places nomination is consistent with the uh, description and the narrative detailed in the landmark designation. Next slide, please. The subject property is a brick and stone late Victorian church designed in the Romanesque revival style, located at the intersection of Blaisdell Avenue South and 26th Street West in the Whittier neighborhood. The original chapel, as you see here, is northwest on the parcel and was completed in 1889, with a northeast auditorium wing added in 1903 and a south parish house addition in 1928. The church was planned and designed to be uh, completed as, in an extended construction schedule, which allowed for the chapel to function alone until the early 1900s auditorium addition. Next slide, please. The building was designed by nationally known church architect Warren H. Hayes, utilizing characteristic Romanesque revival motifs uh, with an interior modified Akron plan, uh, diagonal auditorium open design. Hayes died after the chapel was completed and put into use, and the Hayes designed auditorium was then completed under the direction of Harry Wild Jones. Uh, Jones completed Hayes' design for the 1903 auditorium and later completed the 1928 Parish House edition. Next slide, please. The nomination states that the Calvary Baptist Church is historically significant under National Register Criteria C for architecture for its local significance as an example of an intact Romanesque revival church designed by Warren H. Hayes and Harry Wild Jones. The building is also the example of the pinnacle of Hayes' skill as a fully formed interpretation of the Romanesque revival style. Um, I will note too that the period of significance for the property um, begins in 1885 
when the chapel building was constructed and it ends in 1928 when the parish house addition was completed. Um, this National Register of Historic Places um, period of significance is consistent with the period of significance for the locally designated landmark. Uh, next slide, please. The building uh, retains very good to high levels of historic integrity at interior and exterior spaces, and it's fully able to convey its historic significance as a Romanesque revival church designed by Warren Hayes and Harry Wilde Jones. Uh, the building and, and structure retain the integrity of uh, location and setting, design, workmanship, uh, materials are all intact, and there's sufficient integrity shown in both interior and exterior spaces to convey the property's significance and communicate the site's history as a late 19th and early 20th century church. Um, next slide, please. I believe we have one more slide or not. Um, with that, staff recommends that the Heritage Preservation Commission adopts uh, CPED's report and approve the National Register of Historic Places nomination for the Calvary Baptist Church located at 2608 Blaisdell Avenue South and direct staff to transmit a letter summarizing the report to the State Historic Preservation Officer. Um, and with that, I'm available for any questions, uh, but I'm happy to take all of your comments on this as well. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Are there any questions for staff? I don't see any questions at this time. Thank you. Um, OK. Uh, oh, yeah, as this is just a discussion item, um, commissioners, are there any concerns or comments about this item? Um, I I think it's exciting to see uh, one of our local landmarks also um, be, be listed on the, the National Register. Um, um, the, I think in some ways that makes it e easier in my mind. Um, we, we clearly think it is historic. Um, and so I, I think there's, um, I guess, T to me, this seems like an, an easy, an easy one. Commissioner Howard. So unlike our local designation that we just discussed, this is one of those that it really is about the distinctive characteristics of the architecture. And, and that's the nature of Criterion C for the National Register. And this one is a slam dunk in my opinion. Um, obviously, we, like you said, as a commission, we already respect it. We've already designated it locally. I think the case is made under Criterion C uh, for the remarkable architecture here and um, using our uh, qualifications for what is a master. I think the master architects here are, are also very clear and, and we know what it is within that work. So I'm excited to see it go forward and, and, uh, and appreciate being a part of that process. Thank you, Commissioner Howard. I think that is a, a good point that this one really is um, because of how it's exemplifying the style. Um, back back in the day when I go downtown, I would bike ride past this building. Um, and so I I'm very familiar with it and I think uh, it, it really does stand out um, both within the neighborhood and the larger context. And I, I think this is one where that is very uh, visually evident. Um, which which makes us you know an an even easier um, one. I wonder if there are any other commissioners who would like to discuss, or if somebody would like to make a motion. Commissioner Sandbolt. I'll make the motion to adopt the CPED report and approve the National Register nomination for the Calvary Baptist Church. Thank you. Is there a second? 30 seconds. Thank you, Commissioner Booty. Any further discussion? Uh, I think we also have to, uh, as part of that recommended motion, to direct the staff to transmit a letter summarizing the report oh, to the State yes. Historic Preservation Officer. What is the exact wording? Let's make sure we get that right. 
Um, I accept that friendly amendment. <laughs> that works. Uh, does the seconder accept the amendment as well? Yes. Thank you. Um, Rachel, did we um, did, did we get that sufficient for the clerk's office? Yeah, um, oh, camera. Um, I think just to be on the safe side, if it's all right with you, um, I copied and pasted it into the chat. So just just to cover our bases, if you, okay, if yes, you folks will... would be willing to, to spell it all out. Thank you so much. That's fine. Um, Commissioner Sandbolt, would you mind reading the, the exact text from the chat? <laughs> I make a motion that we adopt the CPED report, approve the National Register nomination for Calvary Baptist Church, located at 2608 Blaisdell Avenue South, and direct staff to transmit a letter summarizing the report to the state historic preservation officer. Thank you, Commissioner Sandbolt. Uh, Commissioner Booty, uh, do you continue Booty. to second? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, is there any further discussion? Seeing none, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll on the motion. Bjornberg. Aye. Booty. Aye. Howard. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Nystrom. Aye. Sandbolt. Aye. Stady. Aye. Struthers. Aye. Vanderike. Aye. Sunberg. Aye. That's 10 yeas and zero nays. Thank you. That motion passes. Um, that concludes our items for tonight. Um, do commissioners or staff have any announcements or new commission business to discuss? I'm trying to reach you or something. I should have just- Okay, there you are. I should have just turned on my camera and mic. <laughs> um, uh, forgive me, I, I'll, I'll speak real quick and then I'll let uh, Commissioner Stady go. Um, just wanted to give an update. The Tyler Street Cook House Northeast, Tyler Street Northeast Cook House, forgive me, the designation study that you heard at the previous HPC meeting um, did go to the Business Inspections Housing and Zoning Committee and was approved on consent earlier this afternoon. Um, also, just an update, I will probably let Commissioner Sandbolt um, give this if she was planning to, but if not, I'm not trying to steal your thunder. Preservation Awards um, coming up this Thursday, virtual event, March 18th, and I believe it starts at 5 or 5.30. Registration is required, I believe. Um, you must be because you ne they need to send you an invitation. And then also just an update, we had another work group, small work group meeting with the Lynnhurst residents for um, the Lynnhurst Historic District Design Guidelines. Uh, it was also a very productive work group meeting. Um, the residents uh, that have participated, which is about three or four, um, had a number of comments. The consultant presented an outline um, and we discussed big, I'd say hot number items, the biggest uh, which I think will be a sticking point is windows and window replacements. Uh, the residents have a lot of strong opinions on the way the, uh, what is proposed for windows. And I think it's everybody on this commission is very familiar with a lot of the um, applications we see. So I anticipate um, We'll have a lot of comments when that comes before you after it goes before the, the State Historic Preservation Office for comment. But the next step in that process is we will have another uh, stakeholder meeting uh, with the residents that have all been invited of that district uh, to comment on um, the next draft of the guidelines, which I think is more of a full outline. Um, 
and some other more fleshed out sections that uh, the work group has identified as very important to them um, before the full draft is completed. That happens on March 30th, a Tuesday evening at 6.30 in the evening. Um, and I think that is the, that concludes my updates. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Um, Commissioner Stady. Hi, I'll acknowledge that this meeting has gone long already. I had a question about, um, I was looking at uh, the historic resources inventory capstone from, I think it's July 2013, Stark Preservation did it. Uh, it I know that we tried to designate 48th in Chicago as a historic district, uh, as a commercial node, and, and uh, there wasn't support in that neighborhood. Uh, but I do wonder if we should be investigating, and maybe this is a topic for a um, retreat, uh, the designation of the 38th in Chicago commercial node. And I'm wondering if we've ever gotten close to doing that. Thank you, Commissioner Stady. I think Andrea probably has some comments on that because I believe City Council has put a lot of thought into what should happen at that intersection. I thank you, um, Chair Sumberg, and thanks for your question, Commissioner Stady. I really, I'll be honest, I'm not at liberty to speak a whole lot about that. I know there is a lot happening with that um, intersection. Um, there has been uh, an introduction, this is, should be public now, into, uh, goodness, what is it, ordinance, or it, it has started a, a discussion about cultural districts and I do, well, you know what, I'm gonna quote myself, but there has been an introduction about cultural districts. And um, I think contrary to what I had just said at a previous either HPC meeting or retreat, um, the HPC has been uh, listed as a body to at minimum comment on cultural districts, uh, very much probably more involved than that, than I can give you at this point. but. In terms of designation, I think that is a very sensitive topic, especially with our leadership. Um, I have not uh, been apprised of any discussions to designate it. I know there have been a lot of comments going around about um, what should happen with that site at this point. Um, I will just let commissioners, or maybe this is a good time. I wasn't ready to make this announcement quite yet, but um, because I'm still working on it, but we do have this award from the National Trust, which is includes public engagement for a larger African-American historic context study, not to say that this site fits perfectly, but it also fits under those themes in, in light of recent events. Um, and I have a feeling this particular intersection will come up during these discussions. I'm in the process of writing an RFP for that grant now, which we are going to kick off here relatively soon. Um, but no, but to, to definitively answer your question, Commissioner Stady, no, there have been no discussions, at least on staff side or from leadership side um, about that intersection. That was a long, to, long answer. Thank you, Andrea. I think I think you got the uh, intent of the question. Um, Commissioner Sandbolt, do you have any comments on the upcoming? I'm looking around because I, I, you know, I got I signed up for the awards ceremony um, and I got a little uh, reminder. Apparently there are custom cocktail kits you can have delivered to you for the award ceremony, which I was not aware of. That's pretty funny. Um, if there are any other uh, notices about the ceremony that people should be aware of? Uh, yeah, so it's happening Thursday night. Andrea covered most of the information. It does start at 5.30. Um, if you haven't registered to attend yet, the registration is still open. Um, you can find a, a link to the registration from either um, the Preserve Minneapolis page or AIA Minnesota page. Um, and yes, there are cocktail kits that you can pick up from, I think, any Lunds or Byerly's, um, and there will be a little cocktail mixing uh, portion of the evening. So please, yeah, look into it. I hope all of you attend. It should be a pretty fun event on Thursday evening. 
Thank you, Commissioner Sandbolt. Is there any other new business items from commissioners? I don't, I don't see any. Um, so with that, we've completed all items on the agenda for this meeting. I'll again ask members and staff if there are any other matters to come before us this meeting. Hello. Oh, hello. Um, I am calling because we received a notice that there was a public hearing today on the windows at our address, 1 Elmwood Place East, Minneapolis, Tangletown. And apparently it was told, we were told it was on your agenda, but it doesn't seem to be on your agenda. Oh, I'm sorry. We're wrapping up the meeting. Um, it was on the consent agenda, right? Isn't, isn't when, that the when was When was that? Staff, perhaps you could better address this question. Because yes, item six was consent agenda. Forgive me, I this is Andrew Burke. I don't know if John is still on the meeting right now, but it was my understanding that uh, the applicant for this, uh, sorry, I'm letting John know about this right now, um, was notified that this was recommended for consent and therefore the, the applicant agreed to it. Um, and so when it was at the very beginning of meeting when the chair sorted the agenda that it was recommended and accepted for consent and no person spoke against it, therefore it was adopted. So forgive me if- okay. um, Okay, we didn't understand that number six. We didn't know that was us. But as long as it's it's been adopted, everything is fine. We're very happy. Yes, it, it passed. It was fine. Okay, thank you. Have a good evening. <laughs> you too. Um, okay, uh, there being no other business this meeting, um, if not, and without objection, I will declare this meeting adjourned. The next regular meeting of the HPC is April 6th, 2021. Thank you, everyone.